All right, welcome back to Powerhouse. You may be seated. Are you ready? Yeah. For a major download. Do you think you can handle it? Yeah. I think you can too. We are currently in the middle of pursuing ways in which we can shift the atmosphere and position ourselves to move in a supernatural, miraculous way. So let's see, without looking at your notes, can you name the first six keys? Okay, one at a time, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Go ahead. Believe. Believe. Okay, who? Yeah. Thankfulness. Has to be somebody different. You too. Yeah. Victorious mindset. Victorious mindset. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh, you already asked. You, you, okay, but, okay, so, uh, yeah, no, that's not yet. Two more. You got it. Uh, expectation. And what's that other one? I don't even know which one we... Manifesting the Spirit. Yeah. So which one, uh, by the number on your hand, which one did you focus on last week? Raise, put your numbers up. All right, one is uh, believe, then two is expectation, three is victorious mindset, four is being filled with the Spirit, five is allowing the Spirit to manifest, and six is thankfulness. All right, okay. Now, I notice that there's not everybody's hand is up. Uh, now, just so you know, my intention is not to bring shame or guilt upon you by asking that question. My intention by asking you which one did you focus on was to show you how all this works. We must be intentional in order to accomplish things in our life. At this point in the game, I think that having a reason to be intentional is more important than the actual keys. Without a good reason, nothing happens. Because we only do things if we have a good reason to do it, right? So I am going to lay out for us an even gooder reason today. Right? That's right. Because it gets gooder and gooder in the Lord. Lousy grammar, great theology. All right. So are you ready? Here we go. Now let me start off with clearly stating what we have become as a powerhouse family. Powerhouse San Pedro is not your down-the-street ordinary local neighborhood church. Powerhouse San Pedro is a spiritual training hub geared to expanding our thinking toward God, to fully grasp what God has given us. In that, we are equipping and empowering individuals with the power that comes from our Creator. We are not an ordinary church. Now, why do I keep saying that? I say that because the term church in our culture has been lost in translation. Our culture our cultural translation for church is so far away from the original meaning. There have been so many misinterpretations that have painted the wrong picture of who God is. In that, the true picture of the church has been lost. I think that people have misrepresented the church. As a result, people have been hurt, confused, and misled. Today, in many ways, the church is nothing like what Jesus originally established. For one, the church was always to primarily be individuals that housed the presence of God, not a building where the power of God resides. Our culture has so redefined what church means and is. For example, people have been taught that the one who hears from God is called the leader or the pastor or the priest. But rather, the ones that hear from God are called the church. This is not a Moses and the children of Israel scenario anymore. All the church is capable and intended to hear from God. 
The pastor shepherds, the teacher teaches, the evangelist evangelizes, the prophet prophesies, etc., etc. The primary focus of today's church people seems to be to study the Bible. Hence, many Bible studies. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not against Bible studies. It's just that most church people today don't know why they're studying the Bible. The best answer that a church person can come up with as to why they study is to know more about God. And that's it. But why? Why know more about God? We seem to be striving to know more about God. And so the more we know, we think, the closer we get. That's not true. Some church people might go as far as to say that they are studying to know more about God so that they can have a deeper relationship with God. Doesn't that sound good? But what does that mean? It sounds good, but what does it mean? You think about it, a deeper relationship with God. How do you define that? It, it, that's just a good answer that we have. Our relationship with God expands and grows when we put into action what we learn. That's how it grows. That's how we become closer, by partnering in interaction when interaction happens with the Holy Spirit. The true church was never meant to simply be a building that we go to. So how do we know where the true church is? How do we know who the true tr church is? The church or the true church are those that can bind the devil, cast him out, and take authority over wickedness. Right? Instead, we have build buildings with crosses and turn them into seeker sensitive or seeker friendly centers with the primary goal of making people happy and comfortable. Now, what do I mean by seeker friendly? That's a term that became a priority in the church at large a few decades ago. The goal of seeker sensitive or seeker friendly is to lure people in by making them happy comfortable and wowed making sure to not offend them and then the church has tried to keep those people in attendance with entertainment non-offensive teaching coffee donuts sprinkled with every kind of ministry and program that can make them better because everybody wants to be better now, the problem with that is God doesn't want to make people better. That's the problem. God's goal is not to make people better. God's plan is to kill the old man and resurrect a brand new species that the power of God can be manifest through. So what happened? The Greek word for church is ekklesia. Ekklesia refers to the gathering of people who house God. Actually, temples of God. And when the temples of God gather, the gathering is called an ecclesia. This here today is an ecclesia, which is a gathering of temples of God. If you're with us by video, or online. As you can see, this is not a stage set with trees and fans blowing to make it look like we're outside. We are actually outside <laughs> at a residence in a neighborhood. We do not have a building. I mean, excuse me. If you have a, if the question is, do we have a building to meet in? Yes, we do. When the weather gets colder, we will meet next door in a rented lodge. There's no cross on top of the building or on the doors. The cross, or should I say, the effects of the cross are in here. 
and we carry it with us as we enter and as we exit. Many people do not consider us as a church. That's okay with me because the term and definition of the church in our culture has been so distorted. I like the fact that we are not associated as a church because we don't look like, sound like, function like an ordinary church. And I'm okay with that. In the past, people have walked away because we do not have a church building. And so we seem like we're an up and coming church to be one day. I see ourselves as more of a spiritual training hub that empowers and disciples people. A building should not determine the power of those that gather. I may not have a big stage behind me, but we are actively pursuing the power of the Holy Spirit in order to transform the world around us. Mark my word. You watch what is to come from this ecclesia. Jesus said in Matthew 16, upon this rock, pointing to himself, I will build my ecclesia and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. What are we permitting? What are we forbidding? And this is another reason we are learning to shift the atmosphere around us. I mentioned earlier that we rent from a lodge to meet in during hot weather or cold weather or whenever we want. That lodge is a Masonic lodge. Dun, dun, dun. When we started to meet in this place, we needed to shift the atmosphere. And we did. We have experienced the amazing presence of God in that place, but that's not enough. We want to learn how to shift the atmosphere everywhere we go, individually and as an ecclesia. It's not enough. Why not, right? I'm going to fly around here. What is the church for? Are we just here to study? Now we're getting serious. Let's expand our thoughts now. Let's expand our thoughts about a few things. One, what is revival? As long as I can remember, most every group, uh, prayer group that I've been part of, people have prayed for revival. I noticed in these prayer meetings that when people prayed for revival, that most everyone would say in hearty amen. I noticed through time that what most church people pray for is revival. What does that mean? Revival. I looked it up. An act of reviving. The state of being revived. When someone is revived, that implies that they were unresponsive or asleep. That means that the church has been asleep. Because revival starts in the church, in the ecclesia. The prayer for the world is repentance. The prayer for the church is revival. You still with me? So if the church is asleep, then the church has been praying or dreaming of waking up. And all that, and all that's going on right now in this world, who is responsible? Have you thought about that? Well, God, I mean, he's the most powerful. Is it really? Who's responsible? The politicians? Who's responsible? The internet? Who's responsible? Social media? Who's responsible? The president? Who's responsible? A political party? Jesus said that 
the ecclesia is the salt of the earth. We are the ones that preserve. We are the light of the world. We are the ones that are responsible. And along with those prayers of revival, I have always heard 2 Chronicles 14, 7, 14. Then if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and restore or heal their land. Why are the people of God blaming politicians for what is going on in the world when all along it's on us. It reminds me of the story of a man who had this huge mustache and one day he was eating some Limburger cheese. From what I hear it's the worst smelling odor of any cheeses. I guess you could say it's cheesy, or that was cheesy. And after eating this cheese, he began to sniff. And he said, it stinks in here. So he moved to the other room to get away from the smell. And he goes, it stinks in here too. So then he goes outside to get some fresh air. Then he starts going, it stinks out here too. The whole world stinks. When it, uh, all the time it was right under his nose. The stink was under his nose the whole time. For the past decades, the seeker-sensitive church has been worried about losing people so much that it developed an expertise in ca catering to people's ne needs or, or should I say wants been right under our nose people have come to the church to see and experience the power of God and all they got for the most part was a visitor packet maybe a mug and an invitation to a new beginners class and don't get me wrong a visitor's packet's good especially if you're a visitor mugs are fun new beginners class can be great a great introductory to a life of freedom and power. But is that what's happening in that class? I'm going to say yes in some places and no in others. In too many churches, it's a visitor's card followed by a standard letter. And don't get me wrong, I don't think that's bad. My point is, what are we teaching people about who churches? I didn't say what churches. I said who churches. The church has been given the keys of heaven. We have been given the keys of heaven. What are we doing with those keys? Some of us have some really nice keychains. Have you noticed that people are not impressed with church anymore? They get tired of hearing what they should do or what they shouldn't do. There's only one thing at this point that will catch their attention. It's the revealing of the miraculous power of God. No coffee, no donuts can top that. Instead, the church has been trying to cover up the miraculous because it's contrary. You see, words just don't cut it anymore. Sermons are not cutting it anymore. Teachings are not cutting it anymore. Action is now required. So let's go back to that term revival. When the shutdown happened last year, the people of God... We're trying to make sense of what was going on. Some said that the shutdown was the enemy. Some felt as though the shutdown was an awakening for the church. 
What do you feel? I heard it put this way. What happened to the church, the ecclesia, was that the church was sound asleep. And while the church was sound asleep, the enemy came in and tried to smother it to death. Thinking that this was going to be the end for the church. And what happened? What happened was the church woke up in the middle of being smothered to death, fighting for survival, fighting to stay alive, and that's what we're seeing now. The lockdown wasn't a shaking of the church. The lockdown caught the church sleeping, and the enemy tried to kill it in its sleep. The church has been awakened fighting for survival Imagine you laying asleep and somebody comes and puts a pillow over your face. You would wake up. Fighting for your life. That's what I think happened to the church. The enemy really thought that he caught the church for a final time. And he meant to destroy it. But we woke up in the middle of being smothered to death. What now? It's time for the people of God to stand up. We're awake now. That prayer for revival, oh, we've been revived. And now it's time to act. Not with just words, but with miraculous, supernatural, powerful acts of God. And this is why we are equipping ourselves with an action of conquering things, shifting atmospheres. Conquering means take control of what's there. This is why we are gathering information on how to shift the atmosphere. It's time to step up and take control of the situations. These 10 keys are positioning ourselves to be precise and powerful with what is already in us. Now, let me Take it even further. You ready? Yeah. Of why these 10 keys are essential for such a time as this. I have some thoughts on what's happening right now in our world. There comes a time when we must think for ourselves and not let others think for us. Right now, we are in a season that seems to be a COVID takeover. Hmm. What does that mean? For the first time in the history of our nation, our rights, our right to choose is wanting to be taken away. But why is that? We're not experiencing a plague where people are dying on the streets with infection, where the homeless are being wiped out with death because of the vi a virus, where the dead are being piled in the streets. What's interesting is that there are nearly the same amount of deaths last year as has been every year. You may have noticed that the number of deaths that happen every year by the flu disappeared last year. Interesting, huh? And there was no flu numbers recorded. Hmm. Just thinking. Tens of thousands of people that died of cancer, heart attacks, and other ailments that people die of were counted as COVID deaths. Interesting. Why is that? I was talking to my friend Brad <laughs> this week. And he said that his uncle, who had bad kidneys, died two weeks ago of kidney failure. And on his death certificate, it was recorded that the reason for death was COVID. 
why is there such a push? Have, have you thought about that? Why is there such a push for this? Why is, why is there such a push for the death reason being this? Yes, hospitals and medical professions do get amounts of money for every COVID patient and every COVID death. See, but there's something fishy. Think. Not just what people have told you, but think. People in my own family have come down with COVID. My extended family. And particularly one got it pretty bad. They were eventually given a medication called ivermectin. And within 24 hours, they were good. And the one that had it really bad eventually was given ivermectin. And within a few days, he was fine. This medication, ivermectin, is one of other medications that is classified in the medical field as a fake drug. And, and it's hard to get. But it works. Isn't that what matters? What's going on? Don't just go off of what you're being told. Think. What's going on? Things are not adding up. I mean, is all this really about masks or social distancing or getting the vax? I'm not even sure what I can call it without being kicked off of YouTube. I'll, I, I've heard them call it vax, so I'm going to stay with that. I think if I call it anything else, I might be <coughs> warned. This is dividing our nation. Have you yeah. realized that? The best, way to, the best way to defeat your enemy is to divide and conquer. Interesting, huh? What's going on? Is it about politics? Is, is it about the medical profession? People are even wondering if the vax has tides to the mark of the beast. What's the mark of the beast? Well, in Revelation 13, 16, it's, it talks about the mark of the beast. And it says that he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. And he, provi and, and he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Interesting. I've been asked... People have asked me, is this vax part of the mark of the beast? Interesting. Are, are, are we in the end times now? What's going on? What does all this mean? I've looked into this. And I'm going to give you my response. Are you ready? I'm not saying that this is anything other than my response. I think that this is a foretaste, or I've heard it put this way, Im an impression of what is to come. What do I mean by impression? Let me explain that. When man was created, a man's, the man's body was made first. And if you were there on the spot to see that, you were standing right there, you would have seen a man. Actually, no. There was an impression in the, dust of, in the dust of the man. There was a dirt image of the man. The man came after God breathed life into the man. So that set a precedence forever with man. There will always be an image in the earth before the event arrives. The impression looked like Adam. But it wasn't yet. I believe that we are seeing today, what we're seeing today is the impression of what is to come. Look at the correlation. The mark of the beast is a mark that is said to be given on the hand or forehead, and we will not be able to buy or sell without it. 
you will be refused service without the mark. Hmm. Interesting. The mark of the beast will be a choice in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Then it will be forced upon everyone. Are you seeing the correlation? During the COVID shutdown, there was Christians that turned in other Christians for meeting without masks. Anybody that would turn you in for no mask will turn you in for not having the mark of the beast. <laughs> I see all this as a trial run. 9-11 wasn't the end. The earthquakes, the rumors of wars, the national disasters, and COVID pandemic isn't the end. What's going on? This isn't the end. I see this as impressions of what is coming. This is the impression of the end that will come. Can you see the impression? One of the names of and descriptions of Satan is the deceiver. The Bible says that in the end times, the very elect will be deceived. How can that happen? The very elect, I mean, the people that are of God will be deceived. How can that happen? There is about to be a great deception in the world and it's going to fool the very elect. So think with me. How do you fool the very elect? How do you deceive the people of God? The very elect will be fooled when they think the voice of the devil is the voice of God. Think about it. How else would you fool? The elect will say things like this, but God told me. It sounded like God. It felt like God. That is the nature of deception. It sounds like, it looks like, it feels like. It even seems like it's for good because good people are in favor of it. And so if they are doing it, then it must be good. That is the nature of deception. We are being prepared for a great deception. A counterfeit looks like, smells like, seems like, but isn't the real deal. When people are being trained to spot counterfeits, they are taught to use multiple ways of detecting depending on how good the counterfeit is. Sometimes the normal ways of detecting may not always work. And so new ways of detecting are always instructed and taught because of the upgrades of counterfeits. How do we know? How do we detect the high quality counterfeits of the enemy? We need to know that. We need to know how to detect the counterfeits of the enemy. The way we detect the counterfeits of the enemy is by the leading, nudging, prompting of the Holy Spirit. We must learn how to be sensitive to the prompting and nudging of the Holy Spirit. There are times that the Holy Spirit nudges us towards ministering to others. And we sometimes say no <laughs> because we're not ready or, you know, we don't want to. When that happens, we tend to justify our actions. In this case, it would be our non-actions. We justify by saying things like, well, you know, God doesn't look down on me if I don't do that. That's true. We say things like, you know, I'm just learning. And that's true. Or God can use someone else, and that's true. And, you know, I'm, not, I'm, I'm just not sure. I don't want to make a fool of myself. 
In other words, nudges of the Holy Spirit can be reasoned away when prompted to even do good. In other words, the ways of God are not always reasonable or not even, they, they may not even make sense according to the culture of this world system. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, To preach the message of the cross seems like sheer nonsense to those who are on their way to destruction. But to us who are on our way to salvation, it is the mighty power of God released within us. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, Someone living on an entirely human level rejects the revelations of God's Spirit, for they make no sense to him. He can't understand the revelations of the Spirit because they are only discovered by the illumination of the Spirit. Watch how closely you walk according to the reasoning and thoughts of our culture. The people of this world tend to rely on experts. The people of God rely on the Holy Spirit. Be careful. Be careful not to let the opinions of this world be your guide. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? Ideals and opinions of this world. Romans 12, 2. Stop imitating the ideals and opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. The ideals and opinions of this world look at Holy Spirit-led people as narrow-minded, unaccepting, unloving, critical and too judgmental the world even thinks that they love better than the people of God you see if you walk too close to that you might start to think in the same way the Holy Spirit is our guide as we walk through life this is why the Bible says in Romans 8 14 for all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God so when we have even a consideration as to what or how we should walk through something, or when we may have the slightest of question or doubt, don't just rely on what worked last time. My phone has a way of adapting to my voice, and it even learns it says, do you want your phone to learn how to pick up your voice? And it learns my intonations. The enemy learns our patterns and watches what we get comfortable with. When the slightest of question or doubt happens, get counsel from trusted followers of God, not just good people. Proverbs 12, 15 says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. Proverbs eleven fourteen 14 says where there is no guidance, the people fall, but in abundance of counselors, there is victory. Proverbs 15, 22 says without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. Proverbs 12, 15, Proverbs eleven fourteen, Proverbs 15, 22, and there's more. Counselor from trusted wives, followers of God. The world has a way of seeking advice from those only that will confirm the way they think. And they don't even want to hear the other side. Have you noticed that? People will even take verses out of context to confirm that what they are doing is right. Be careful. Be careful. There is coming a time where the body of Christ will need to take a stand on many different levels and on many different issues. Well, how would we, how would we know where to stand? The Holy Spirit will direct you and confirm it on many levels if you're listening. If the world views were opposite of Jesus, even to the point of hating him, why do you think they will treat you any different? 
We all want to be liked. (laughs) But be careful. Don't become a seeker-sensitive person where you are seeking the favor of people more than doing what is right for the moment. Taking a stand means not just going along with what sounds good. As for the vax, I think that it's a personal decision. I'm not saying that it's evil. But do you see the impression? I don't know what's in the vax. I don't have that information. I don't know if anybody does fully. It's a quandary. Something very interesting. Something fishy about it. I don't know what it is. But I do see the impression. Can you see how the entire world can be forced to do something? Can you see it now? I never could see that before in my lifetime. How can you force the whole world to do something? That's impossible. I don't think that's impossible anymore. With the reasoning of it being best for everyone. We are trying to be bullied. First by shame from each other, then by sanctions, penalties, and rewards, then by force. Right now, money is being given to those who get the vax. (laughs) Wow. I was watching a Dodger game this week, and they were advertising in between innings that you can get the vax at the game under the pavilion bleachers. And when you do, get this, they will give you two free Dodger tickets. I had to second guess that. Wow. Something fishy is going on here. Do you see it? Did you know that there are polls and petitions that people have signed in favor of imprisoning those who do get who do not get the vax? That's ridiculous. Right? I mean, people wouldn't think like that. Right? Our nation is on the cusp of bypassing our own constitutional rights to make something happen. What's going on? Are we coming to a point where our choice is being taken away? But why? Why is this? Because we don't know what's good for us? Is that why? Is it because we're protecting? Who? Are we protecting the people without the vax or are we protecting the people with the vax? I don't get that. Why are we talking about this? You may be going, why are we even bringing this up at church? Because we must. If we don't, it will be shoved under the rug and made into it the elephant in the room. You see, I have nothing to gain by being on one side or the other. But if we don't address it, we empower it. Our country is not, was not founded on principles where we are told that we are going to make you do something or you will lose your job. But this is what's happening today. I've had people call me saying that they're at that crossroads. There will come a time where you will need to decide whether your job is more important than being dictated as to what you must do. There is coming a time where we will need to say, go ahead, take my job. God will give me four back. So let's wrap this up. There was three Hebrew children that said that they will not bow, not to a vax, but just not bow. Just not bow. I believe that there were many people there that probably said, well, it won't hurt to bow. (laughs) We can get forgiveness tomorrow, right? 
if it's bad. They could have also said, you know, I'm not going to bow in my home, but when I'm in public, I'll, I'll do what everyone else does. Three Hebrew boys took a stand. And their stand caused a wicked king to turn his view of who God was. This week, think through things. We're getting information from both sides. Think. Don't let other people think for you. You do the math. Follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I mean, actually ask him. Seek wise counsel, advice. Don't just go on what worked yesterday. We have an enemy. He's cunning. And now that we, the church, are awake, it's time to start taking control of situations and get ready to move with the supernatural, miraculous power of the Holy Spirit. That's why we're learning to shift atmospheres. It's time to position ourselves with the keys of the kingdom, with intention to use them. Choose to believe in the truth with expectation. Walk about your day with a victorious mindset, being filled with the Holy Spirit as your strength and guide, displaying the fruits of the Spirit you already have in you, and do all this with the momentum of being thankful. And did you know that this week is going to be spectacular. So get ready for it. And when spectacular happens, let me know. I want to know about the spectacular things that God is going to do in and through you this week. This week is not like any other week. So get ready. We're awake, and it's time to move. It's time to act. It's time to position ourselves and gather what we need to unleash the power of God on a world that needs to see who he truly is. I want to thank you for joining me this morning here at Powerhouse. And with that, I will see you next week.